My name is Average Joe, and I'm a proud geek with expertise in movies, superheroes, and animation. And my name is Pixel Patch. I'm a joyful geek with an expertise in gaming, both tabletop and video. Our mission is to bring nerd culture to the masses. And by sticking it all under the microscope. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Bat Jar Podcast. Movies, TV, manga, comic books, or is that graphic novels, cartoons, groups, that's animation, Disney, Star Wars, Dragon Ball, Z, Pokemon, and Digimon, and Mighty Morphin, Power Rangers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Yogi, Yo, and Nintendo, Bow. Cinematic Bow. Universes, Marvel, DC, Justice League, and Batman, 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 Air quotes, normal voice again. Ah, oh, very nice. I, I, I was on the mend pretty quickly there. I still have bronchitis, so I don't know. Maybe my voice has dropped. Maybe I should be speaking like this during yes. our entire podcast. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, one can only do so much. Something significant happened in nerd culture land this week. Uh, quite a few things, actually. I don't know if you're thinking about the same thing that I'm thinking about. Well, the thing that I'm going to... We're not going to do news today. We'd be remiss to not acknowledge the fact that the Big Bang Theory had its series finale. Oh, I was thinking of the team up between Microsoft and Sony. No. All right. All right. So, But the reason why the Big Bang Theory is important is because the name of this podcast, and in fact, the impetus of this podcast, owes a lot of credit to the Big Bang Theory. I did not know that. All right. So anybody who's been listening to this show for long enough will remember this, but the reason why this is called the Bat Jar podcast is because I own a Bat Jar a Batman cookie jar. Right. And I grew up as a fan of nerd culture, but I never gave any thought to the idea of owning something like a Batman cookie jar. Right. Because why would you think that you need such a thing? But then the Big Bang Theory started, and there's an episode in the first season where the central plot line has something to do with the fact that Leonard and Sheldon, who are roommates, own this Batman cookie jar, and they're basically arguing about who gets to keep it. Oh, geez. And in watching that episode, I thought to myself, they have a Batman cookie jar. Why don't I have one of those? (laughs) And I really think that that show came about at a time when nerd culture was really starting to become mainstream. You know, it was right before the MCU really took off. Yep. Transformers uh, was like one of the biggest movies of that year. Yep, yep. And I... Even though I have negative things to say about the Big Bang Theory as a show... Oh, of course. A lot of people do. It's still brought in a whole bunch of nerd culture to the light whereas the things that they did because they were a little bit odd or like oddballs people just enjoyed in general doing like on the side yeah yeah like i see people wearing superhero shirts all the time now right and i can't help but wonder do how much do they actually know about that thing that's on their shirt (laughs) because the big bang theory had characters wearing shirts like that all the time and so the whole kind of journey of this show being named the bat jar podcast comes from the idea that nerd culture has become more prevalent and therefore there's a need for the layperson to be introduced to all these kind of crazy concepts that exist in nerd culture. Right. And we go inside the bat jar to discuss these things. Nice. So I didn't watch the finale. I don't follow the show anymore. I plan to watch it at some point just to... I know that there's a D&D episode somewhere in there and I plan on watching that, but that's about it. So Big Bang Theory, thank you very much for for giving our show a name. We have a special guest with us for this week's episode. I see him. He is uh, present on our table and far more intimidating. He is uh, very close to my water. I can hear the rattle. So Optimus Primal Mm -hmm. is here in the person. What? Not Optimus Prime? No. In fact, there's an entirely different character called Optimus Primal. Well, that's just Prime. And he comes from a series that we're going to be speaking about today called Beast Wars. Which uh, started airing just as I was growing up. My brothers watched it religiously. Uh, When I was around like seven or eight years old, it was uh, playing every week on like YTV. And yeah, like I, I remember watching that 
every week and I was too scared as a kid to watch the finale because I was so young and it was so intense. Uh, I actually w- and went back and watched the finale years later. So this is indeed a Transformers property. Mm-hmm. And when you first look at it, if you watch the, you know, the intro sequence for the show, you might have a hard time associating with Transformers and there's many reasons for that. <laughs> But let's go into the Wayback Machine. Let's go back to when the show was being developed. Let's go back to the early 1990s. Woo! I was busy being born. Yep, same here. It really was a rough time for Transformers. The original series had ended and that toy line had ended. And their efforts to kind of keep Transformers in the spotlight, if you will, didn't work. Right. They tried releasing new toys that were kind of like repainted versions of the original Transformers. And it was almost as if... Transformers were going to disappear altogether. Right. In fact, Hasbro was really struggling with ideas on how to reinvent or how to... We don't know what to do. Maybe Bionicles will save... Nope. That's, a, that's Legos. Yeah, exactly. But it, it's it's strange to think about that there was a time when Transformers was on their way out. Yeah, like Zoids. Zoids definitely had its heyday with uh, the original TV show and then the anime around the same time as Transformers. But recently, other than a few video games here and there, it kind of exited the public consciousness so it could have gone that direction it's very easy to see that beast wars became my first exposure to anything transformers related whoa whoa don't you mean beasties but yeah same here uh in canada it was we couldn't have the name war in the title so it was renamed beasties and it was my first i didn't even know about transformers i actually knew about zoids before transformers because zoids was an original like cartoon that my brothers would watch and then beasties came along and it was a ton of fun like it was my first introduction to these weird transforming creatures and these crazy storylines but yeah so let's talk about the censorship because you you brought it up <clears throat> indeed if as it aired on ytv in canada the show was actually called beasties colon transformers mm-hmm. beasties! The logic being that I guess Canadian censorship laws suggested that you couldn't have a program aimed at children with war in the title. Yeah. So I'm guessing uh, any reason like you can't sell uh, weapon related items to, to like kids and yeah, I- including um, what is it in tabletop games? Um, if it has an age restriction on it, so like uh, seven and up, you can only have certain themes in a seven and up game. Uh, so much so that some of the board games I had when these um, discussions were in place actually have small stickers above the age rating that have a 14 and up age rating. And if you peel it off, it says 7 and up. Well, it's it's very bizarre because you think about like Star Wars yeah. is, is very much a thing. <laughs> it's like what if if Star Wars was going to air on YTV, would they call it Starries? <laughs> yeah, Star, Star, uh, Star Adventure. <laughs> The, the reason why I find this censorship so hilarious is because in terms of the actual toys you could go and buy, in terms of even buying like the video cassettes, all of that said Beast Wars. So Just the title of the airing. On t- Canadian television. Wow. So if you're, if you're trying to ensure that like, you know, young children are not exposed to things that are too mature for them or, you know, the concept of war is very complex and trying to understand the nature of it, go all the way. Like, don't. Don't just censor the TV, censor the toy line, censor the home video releases. Yeah, exactly. Because, yeah, it's it seems it seemed really dumb at the time. I still think it's dumb. It's, it's still dumb. <laughs> but I would agree with you. Like, even though the, the subtitle Transformers is there, when you watch the show for the first time, you have no idea that it's associated with Transformers. No, because, okay, so for, for the lay people out there, like... The Transformers, when you originally watch it, is very easy to know they're Transformers. They're these giant robots that transform into vehicles. With Beasties, they're these, uh, you know, robots, but they transform into full animals. So when they're in their animal shape, you literally don't know that they're robots. And when they transform out of that, they still have all these animal shapes that make up their their design. So it's 
it's very, very difficult for like, especially if you're a young kid to make the link between it. Like when I saw the first episode where there were the original Transformers in episode one, you can see them as they're struggling with the ship that's crashing. And I was like, oh, who are those guys? I had no clue. And then when they transformed into the beast modes, I was like, okay, this is the characters that the story is actually about. I don't know who the heck those first guys were, but whatever. Um, yeah, uh, super, super weird. So the people at Hasbro took a huge risk and basically completely reinvented their concept because mm-hmm. the Transformers was purely branded as this line of robots that turn into vehicles. And the transition from turning from a, a vehicle into a robot kind of made sense because they were both mechanical yep. in nature. So really, they did something kind of crazy by really, I guess, thinking outside the box and saying, okay, like what else can we mix uh, robots with? <laughs> which on a certain level, it does sound very strange. Like the, uh, it's like literally tech and organic Mm -hmm. which nowadays is commonplace but back in the 90s like you had a few um like i think what was it uh my goodness snow crash uh, 1980s or it was the 1960s was one of the first cyberpunk novels and like augments and enhancements and like human and like um organic mixing with tech very very early concept like cyberpunk and cyber technology is very recent. And so to have that kind of as a mainstay of the series is, yeah, it's pretty gutsy. Pretty darn gutsy. So this might not surprise anybody, but a show like Beast Wars only ever exists because of Hasbro. And Hasbro is a toy company. Yep. So You make shows to sell toys. You sell toys to make shows. And what makes shows that Hasbro produces so ingenious is it's based it's franchises like Transformers and My Little Pony, wherein the actual characters are the products. Yep. So to this day there are still laws for television about like how you cannot actually directly market and advertise to children through your shows. Yeah. But the the way you do that is you make the actual show the advertisement. You make all the characters in the show the products that you're selling. There was um, a version of it on the Strong Bad Emails, which was like an, uh, from 2004 to 2009 weekly animated email answer. And they had this whole segment called Cheat Commandos. And the Cheat Commandos had their, their tagline where it's just like every weapon they used and every line they had had just this cheesy overlaid like this is a uh, oh no let's get into the product placement battle tank and and then at one point it's like let's get into the ramshank or it's made of all the toys we couldn't sell and then it's just like cheat commandos buy all our play sets and toys and literally other than the like hammering you over the head idea of it it's pretty much it like they made the show to like beyblades like most like animes of the 2000s were made to sell toys yes so hasbro had a partner in japan called takara and they were basically the company that actually came up with all the designs for the toys of course so takara and hasbro came up with the concept of beast wars this idea that you have transformers that turn into animals yeah and hasbro trying to replicate the success they had with their first generation of transformers decided to make an animated series about it But they went even further out of the box and did something which I think in the long in the long run paid off for them. They approached a company called Mainframe Entertainment in Vancouver, who holds the record, if you will, for being the first animation studio to create a fully computer animated television series. Oh, wow. Wait, what about Reboot? That came after? So I'm speaking about Reboot. So Reboot was was the first computer animated television series produced by Mainframe Entertainment. And Beast Wars became the second series that they produced. Absolutely. I mean, I'm still waiting for the reboot reboot. There was a reboot reboot. It's terrible and it's on Netflix. Oh, right. Uh, it's I remember called you. The Guardian Code. No, no, don't, no. It doesn't don't do exist. It. Doesn't exist. Yeah. So anyway, so they took the risk of essentially, you know, working with this Canadian animation studio that had really only done one show. And everything that they did on reboot, they had to like create the software and the technology for, because what they were looking to do didn't exist. Like this is before toy story. Yeah. You like, have to remember when reboot came out. Three, like I remember toy story had this little animatic in it, which was like a mini, uh, a mini movie, uh, about this baby crawling around and chasing after like a, a tin soldier. And it was horrifying. Like the, but this was Pixar's work and it looked like nowadays, um, just a tech demo. Like it was, Yeah, 3D has come a long way. Yeah, so Reboot's a topic for another day, but all that to say, the people who made Reboot 
were asked to make Beast Wars. That makes a lot of sense. So what that means for Beast Wars is that if you go back and watch the episodes now, a lot of the animation is pretty simplistic, pretty uh, hard to look at, I would say. Yep. Like a lot of the backgrounds, especially in the early episodes. Oh, it's just mounds. It looks like N64 graphics. Yep, yep. And I really attribute Beast Wars to one of those plays that has one set. Yeah, so pretty much. I, so if, you're near the ship or you're near the Decepticon ship or you're in like a third location other than like seasons like seven and eight where they got snow or the moon. <laughs> no, what I mean to say is like you go, yeah, as a play that only has one set has to be very inventive with its cast and its writing. Right. Because they not only have to create scenarios in which the one set is used continuously, you have to like tell the narrative that kind of brings different characters in and out of the one set. And it has to engage you and keep you interested. So with Beast Wars as a show, with the animation being computer animation, they uh, they only had so much budget. And you can bet that Hasbro's number one priority was that the characters looked good. Yeah. Because you know what? these This show exists to sell toys. We, 100%. So most of the budget, I'm told, was spent on making the character designs look decent hey rat trap is always a fun character like the the hands the hands always looked like super well done <laughs> they blew millions of dollars on those hands yeah and the reality is that with with something like beast wars when your entire cast is all robots you can get away with making them look a little robotic yes hey the challenge of course comes with them trying to do the uh, animal forms that are supposed to look like real animals. Yeah, that one's a little bit tough. Like the the rat scampering, I think, is the closest one. Waspinator's bee movement was always a little bit weird, a little bit off, and a little bit erratic. But, yeah, you know, they did their best. So the writers of this series, the producers, the guys who are credited with creating Beast Wars, had the very challenging task of trying to essentially do more with less. Right. And I'm always curious like what this actually means for creators. It, it's like if you actually have to work within a, a set number of boundaries Mm -hmm. does that actually limit you or does it force you to get creative i okay from someone who has had that limitation uh once again tying back to the board game community got to do it um there was a group that we were part of where early on we only had access to like making um cards of this size or if you tried to put in certain components it literally just wouldn't help like you could put in a stack of hundred dollar at ten dollar bills for people to track money or you could invent a new way to track money that uses like a playing card now oh suddenly your cost is like three or four dollars lower per game and that's amazing so you come up with all these creative ways of using things that you wouldn't be doing otherwise so I, i think overall it helps creativity because you come up uh, because of the limitations you're forced to come up with creative ways of solving a problem that you can't solve with brute force throwing money at it so the two men who are credited with creating beast wars are bob forward mm-hmm. and larry detilio backwards oh, oh sorry okay but larry what detilio detilio all right so bob forward i'm going to read you off some of the shows he's worked on okay and you can tell me if that makes sense that he was involved with beast wars it sounds good he-man yep <laughs> she-ra yep uh, the Legend of Zelda animated series. Ah, uh, yep. Oh, well, excuse me. <laughs> yep. The 90s Incredible Hulk series. Yep. <laughs> and he was a writer on seven episodes of X-Men Evolution. Yeah, that makes sense. Although I almost would have seen him in the original X-Men based on writing style, but... Larry Dottilio actually just passed away uh, this past March. So oh, wow. Rest he, in peace, Larry. Uh, yes. But he is most famous... For being the executive story editor of Babylon 5. Wow. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. After Beast Wars, right? Right before. Oh, okay. Interesting. Well, that lends itself a lot to the style that Beast Wars has done. And, like, there's a lot of back and forth between these two uh, factions, a lot of, like, changing sides and loyalties and stuff. Like, yeah, uh, that makes a ton of sense. Interestingly, he also worked on He Man. And what I find super interesting, he wrote one episode of Murder, She Wrote. Oh. <laughs> All right. So I'm really hoping Jessica Fletcher uh, you know, makes an appearance in Beast Wars. That would be amazing. <laughs> Surprise. 
So, so we basically have we have two writers here who are the ones kind of steering the ship of Beast Wars. Neither of them really having very any... difficult to steer that ship. It crashed in episode one. Yes, uh. but neither of these men really had experience with the Transformers, the first generation. They kind of just knew nothing about it. So we have the Babylon Five guy. Yep, and then the guy who's more like He Man. Yep. So you've got like the big fight sequences, and then uh, the intrigue and politics, which really shows in the TV show. Like even now, just thinking back. Okay, so. Let's go a little bit into two of the characters just so that there's a baseline. Uh, but there is a Velociraptor character and a uh, Tiger and Spider character. And throughout the entire show, there's huge discussions that go on between these characters about loyalty, about changing side, especially the Velociraptor. I cannot remember his name. Do you know? Dinobot? Literally Dinobot? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay, I'm going to throw show myself out, throw myself out the window. Dinobot has a constant back and forth of like changing loyalties, learning about like, uh, the, like learning about which side is which. And it just, it was the first time as a child that I'd run into a TV show where a bad guy becomes a good guy. Like it's a very common trope in anime. Like <laughs> uh, it's surprisingly common in anime. Uh, but it had, I had never seen that before. I was just like, well, no, he's a bad guy. He's obviously, uh, they're obviously going to like, uh, he's gonna betray them, and he ends up like helping them out in the end. It was just like, yeah. and this really gets into like the creative challenges that the writers of Beast Wars had to work around. Mm-hmm. So in the original Transformers show, they really didn't have any budgetary concerns, so they could literally have as many Autobots and as many Decepticons in any episode. They could have special ones just kind of come in for one episode, and oh, there's their toy. Okay, bye. Yeah. And in in either case, Optimus Prime. And Megatron, the leaders of the Autobots and the Decepticons, were kind of portrayed as like the ultimate leaders. Yeah. And aside from Starscream's kind of constant mission to usurp Megatron, there really uh, wasn't anyone who was there to kind of question the leadership of the original leaders. Whereas with Dinobot, like there's constant, like very, very tense moments where, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, Megatron's got him by the throat and he's just like, are you questioning me? And was he the same voice as uh, Megabyte from no. Reboot? No, okay. But it, it's just like holding him there it's like questioning me and Dinobot has to do these like philosophical and and discussion like acrobatics just to like hide this whole interior war that he's got going on and it's crazy like it's and this, absolutely and this crazy. again goes back to the limitations put upon the writers because hasbro wanted certain characters in the show because they wanted certain toys to sell yeah and so they were they, the, the writers didn't really have control over which characters are going to be appearing in the show mm-hmm. but they knew that they could only have a fixed number of characters right so they couldn't do what the original Transformers show did and just have not only a ton of regular characters but then a bunch of guest characters yeah now they knew they were working with a smaller cast and they knew that they had to like kind of keep the locations down to a minimum as well. So the biggest way Beast Wars kind of profited from those restrictions is that they had to really develop the characters. Yeah. So the in Beast Wars, there are two factions of Transformers. They're not the same ones from the original series. No, which the original series was the Decepticons and the Autobots. Autobots. In this series, we have the Maximals and the Predacons. So the Maximals... Whenever they landed, they scanned a bunch of mammals like rhinoceros, rats, uh, Optimus Primal scans a monkey. Um, oh, my gosh. Uh, uh, there's tiger. Rhinox. Rhinox. Oh, man. Rhinox was the best. Cheetor. Cheetor? Oh, I forgot about Cheetor. Hey, he actually was a really fun character. Rat Trap. No, Rat Trap, I remember. <laughs> Rat Trap. He was always fixing things. Uh, and then the uh, Predacons scanned a whole bunch of, like, dinosaurs from Earth. So, like, they land on Earth and scan these things. So, like, Megatron scans, like, a T-Rex, of course. Uh, the Velociraptor, Dinobot is, like, the the other scan. But you've also got a lot of bug types. <laughs> bug type Pokemon. Ah, uh, gosh. Um, so you've got, like, Wasp and your Waspinator. Uh, Black Arachnia. Black Arachnia was a really complex character. Her entire story arc with the Floating Fortress. Anyways, look up for- Floating Fortress, guys. Great story arc. Pterosaur. Who was Pterosaur? This is the uh, He was the pterodactyl, one? Okay, yeah. I, I should be able to guess these. It, they were named, very aptly named. Tarantulas. He was like the tarantula spider. Oh, predicon. right, because the, um, the Black Widow had a, a male counterpart. Yep. He never he never had a loyalty issues. Inferno, Quick Strike. Inferno? 
Inferno was a, a guy who was like the ant, the red fire ant. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then Quick Strike was the eagle? No. No, no. Quick Strike was like a... Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about him later. Okay. Wait, but, why later? Well, because it gets into like... Uh, basically, the whole story of Beast Wars is that everything that happens in the show is a result of the limitations the writers were working with. So right. not only did they have this limited animation budget... And they had to work with a limited cast, limited locations, but they also had to work in all the story elements that Hasbro wanted. Right. And the problem that they ran into, especially in the beginning, is Hasbro wasn't sure where they were taking the Beast Wars franchise. Oh, great. So when they first crash land on this planet, there's two moons in the sky, and it's unclear. They don't know where they are. Right. Uh, And we also don't know if they've traveled through time or if they're just on another planet. Like, they... There's a lot of stuff that is kind of left ambiguous, and it wasn't because the writers were trying to set up a bunch of mysteries because they literally didn't have direction from Hasbro. <laughs> we'll just make it a planet, fix it later, fix it in post. Well, they, one, well, it was Bob Ford who said he said, "Yeah, well, we put two moons in the sky, and, and and it's like, well, if later on we decide this is Earth, then we can just blow up one of the moons." <laughs> and that's what they did. <laughs> they they eventually blew up one of the moons and. Yeah, they established that it was on Earth. Oh my God! So when when the series begins, these basically these two factions of Transformers land on this planet. We yep. don't know what planet it is yet, yep. and we find out there's a whole ton of Energon on this planet. Energon is of course the uh, main energy source for Transformers. The original series uh, of Transformers often involved them fighting over Energon. Yeah, so oil fields. Got it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> And so, you know, the biggest kind of obstacle they had to get into right away with the story is saying, well, if they're on this more or less uninhabited planet and like, there's, there's no humans around, what's the point of them transforming, right? Like, why would, these, why would these robots need to assume alternate forms if there's no one to hide from? Yeah. Got to hide from each other. Well, do you remember, like, what the reason they gave was? Well, was, weren't they, like, running low on energy or something and they had to, like, transform to survive? Kind of, yeah, you're kind of on point. Okay. Basically, they, they write into the story that because the planet they're on is so full of energon that it actually, like, causes their robot modes to overload, essentially, and get sick. Oh, well, there you go. So the only way they can get close to the energon is by transforming into these beast modes. There we go. That, there's the workaround. So it, it's, it, you know, the more I learned about how they made this series, I was just kind of impressed on how they kind of had to, like, address all these... Uh, creative challenges or these limitations put upon them and ironically because beast wars went straight to syndication it didn't have to deal with any censorship issues so like you know characters were allowed to get shot and blown apart and Mm -hmm. and violence was okay even like even in canada even though the show had to have its title changed none of the content of the show was changed no you still had people like getting laser eyed in the face or just like having limbs cut off like they're there were some intense moments. And I guess because they're robots, it's fine. It's fine. No, like they, there was like boiling uh, pits of molten metal that people were definitely thrown into and slowly assimilated into. Like there was some pretty intense. As I said, like the last um, the last 10 episodes were too intense for me as a kid. Like I got scared and I couldn't watch it. So eh. returned later to, to see that it was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Well, no, and you brought up the point of the complexity of the characters. So in the original Transformers, none of the Autobots ever really argue with Optimus Prime. Like, he gives the directions and they follow them. Yeah, and you, they're part of this team and that's what they do. But, like, Rhinox, Rat Trap. Rat Trap's always going off and getting into trouble, it was especially Cheetor. Cheetor's, like, the, um, the phlegmatic, like, personality that's all over the place and he doesn't he's the sorry he's the teenager yeah, he's like the equivalent of a bumblebee yeah yeah pretty much with and the beast wars characters. he's just like oh you know like why don't we do this and why don't we do this it's like cheetor we can't go and do this and he's just like ah oh, come on man <laughs> but it, it it was what made the show interesting is that and i'm speaking about beast wars of course yeah is that even though optimus primal and megatron yes megatron is the name of the exact same name for both the Decepticon and the Predacon. I know that's probably confusing for people. But the thing that was interesting about the Beast Wars characters with Optimus Primal and Beast Wars Megatron is that as leaders, they weren't really super well appreciated leaders. No, and pretty much every other episode, there were problems and or battles that were failed because their subordinates just literally did not listen to them. Like at one point, there's this, uh, I still remember, that was a really tense episode. The um, 
Predacons have launched an attack on the uh, on the ship of the M. Starts with an M. What's their their Maximals? Team? Maximals. My gosh, I'm not going to be able to remember that. They launch an attack on the ship of the Maximals, and they are so close to being able to get that last shot off to hit the the uh, generator, so that the shield will never be able to get repaired for another like month, and they'll just be able to take it down. And Dinobot and uh, Lady Arachnia just mess it up because they're not listening. And it was just like, you wouldn't see that in the original Transformers, but it lent some really tense moments. No, and a lot of, I say kids shows, but a lot of animated series from the 80s and 90s featured like, these are the good guys and these are the bad guys. And it was very clear as to who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. Yeah. I mean, the original Transformers is a perfect example of that. So Beast Wars added this layer of complexity because... Yes, you do have characters that are not only questioning the the leadership of their particular faction, but there's also a lot of people kind of not just switching sides, but really reevaluating their philosophy or their perspective. Yeah, even on the good side, like there are conversations that are had between subordinates, uh, between the Maximals and the Predacons that they're sneaking off and they're having conversations. They're like, well, maybe we're not supposed to be doing this. Like once again, the um, Fortress in the Sky arc, like they discover... A source of power other than uh, everything that they've been fighting for and the subordinates are like well maybe we shouldn't tell uh, Optimus Primal and Megatron about this like maybe this is something that we can use or maybe this is more than than we are more than we are, are given to to know and it, it's just so different yeah there's lots of characters who come into the series who are officially aligned with either side but then they might be officially like a Maximal or a Predacon, but they kind of have their own agenda. Mm-hmm. And Tarantulist is a great example. He basically becomes his own faction at one point, uh, completely separate from either Maximal or Predacon. Dinobot certainly is the one who kind of flip-flops the most. Like, oh, my gosh. He kind of goes back and forth like at least three or four times between the two sides. Yeah. But he has like more or less legitimate reasons for each kind of heel turn he has. Yeah. And once again, that's a, a product of good writing. It's just like you're not just changing to make things interesting, although you are. Uh, you're changing because you have a legitimate uh, concern that came up that wasn't addressed. An interesting plot point I didn't really catch when I watched the show originally is that at the beginning of the show, Cybertron is inhabited by Maximals and Predacons. Like the original planet. The original planet okay. Cybertron. Okay, cool. And you learn throughout the series that in fact, the characters from Beast Wars, like Optimus Primal and everybody, are actually from the future of the original Transformer series. Okay. Essentially, at some point, all of the Autobots became Maximals, and all of the Decepticons became Predacons. So there was like kind of like an evolution of sorts where the characters went through this change. And the present day for these Beast Wars characters is a present day where maximals and predacons actually coexist on cybertron i never caught that in the original like that's so weird and so the the beast wars megatron is actually like the leader of like a splinter group of predacons who want to overthrow the maximals and the only way they can do that is by leaving the planet where everything is peaceful yes Uh, i think so yeah well hey well initially again in the beginning they hadn't figured any of the story details like they weren't even sure if the story was set on earth or in the past or anything i just remember the moon being a huge thing like there's a big transponder on the moon and like optimus primal goes out there some information i really need to re-listen to it because i'm curious well and this, and this is the thing so they had the first season was 26 episodes which is pretty standard for an animated series at that time it was mostly like kind of like one-off episodes and most of the stories were about Either the auto or the Autobots, my goodness, the Maximals or the Predacons trying to gain tactical advantage over the other, whether it was over an Energon source or, or perhaps a, a feature of security for their base, which was or, basically their, just their crashed ship. Or in the very early uh, episodes, new, uh, new Autobots. Like, you mean Maximals. Yeah, new, well, so there were some new Predacons that are around. Yes. So and th- this, is becomes, this becomes where the toys come into play because the way that they wrote into the series that they could introduce new characters is that when the ships crash land at the beginning of the show, all of these stasis pods kind of like f- fall out of the main ship and they're floating in orbit. And they, you know, apparently there's elements of beast wars that became like core parts of transformers lore after the fact. Oh, interesting. So the idea of each individual transformer having their own spark mm-hmm. was introduced in beast wars. Okay. Wow. And the idea of a protoform was introduced in beast wars. And what's that? 
A proto form is basically a kind of like template body, I suppose, a body that can take on the form of whatever it's scanned to match. Right, which is, okay, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, throughout the series, all these new characters show up who are, they're all maximal protoforms, meaning they're all transformers that just sort of haven't woken up yet that are programmed to be maximals. And there's many episodes where essentially the the different groups are fighting over getting access to these pods because if they get the pod, then they can wake up the person inside and kind of code them to be one of theirs. Right. So a couple of the characters in the series, like Black Arachnia, mm -hmm. are maximals in by nature, but then they're nurtured essentially to become Predacons. Which is so crazy to think about. Like, that's that's some crazy writing that you would not see in a kid's show. Well, and it just emphasizes the kind of complexity of it all because you you have somebody who by birth is uh, a maxil, but then they're being kind of like formatted to be a Predacon, and then they have to kind of decide where in their own philosophy or behaviors match the one side or the other. And because the leaders of these groups aren't like the super general leaders of the original organizations, these are kind of like subpar people. Like the, the Megatron here is kind of like a lunatic who's kind of like off on his own. He really is in some episodes. Like he's, yeah. <laughs> He's and got a few uh, bolts loose. Yeah, and Optimus Primal is not like the big leader of all Autobots like Optimus Prime was. He's like the leader of a small group of people. Mm -hmm. So it's a totally different dynamic. And it, I, I, as a kid, like I think you mentioned it earlier, it's like, yeah, like seeing that kind of complexity in character writing was kind of uncommon for the time. Yeah, like Dinobot, like I didn't know what the heck was going on when he changed sides. I was like, he can do that? <laughs> he, but he's a bad guy. How is he doing that? <laughs> like. Once again, anime, it's now like a common trope, but did not run into that as a kid. And like that kind of writing and that that kind of investment in the story like helps detract from the kind of quality of the animation. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you don't care that things don't look really impressive because you're drawn into the characters. I wonder if they would ever like, if there's a fan made version of a, a redone animated set of episodes. I'd have to take a look at that. Well, it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier is like maybe it's a good thing that the animation isn't as strong oh, yeah. because that forced them to tell a good story. Mm -hmm. And I think that came about like there were definitely uh, like uh, there were, of all the TV shows in that era, like of the 3d ones, like the last season of reboot was just nuts. Like it was crazy. There were so many layers going on like uh, with the net and like the, the TV series. Uh, but with beast wars with beasties, it yeah no it was just don't so call it different. beasties that's a <laughs> we are not afraid of war on this show we are not afraid of war beast wars there you go but they they had to still kind of bow to the demands of hasbro so they had to find ways to introduce if not new characters new modes for the characters right so they had the fusors kind of spin-off line of beast wars fusors were an idea of taking two different animals and putting them together and making that a transformer surprise so that's where silverbolt comes from he's the wolf that has like bird wings and right right yeah he was my favorite character and quick strike who was like a scorpion that had a uh, cobra for a cobra head for a tail for a tail yeah yeah okay now i remember that my goodness then in the second season they introduced trans metal which basically was a a way to upgrade a lot of the characters. Mm -hmm. So in the original Transformers, they did the movie and killed off a bunch of characters and then introduced new ones, and that's how they got new toys on the market. What Beast Wars did is that they basically like have a bunch of their existing characters go through like a metamorphosis. So they they go from having beast modes that look like genuine animals to beast modes that are kind of like obviously robotic in nature, like they're colored blue and green and colors that would not be uh, typical animal colors yeah like uh, i think uh quicksilver himself had like this like kind of teal blue wolf body and like these crazy like uh, eagle parts and was now really when you said quicksilver did you mean silverbolt silverbolt there you go quicksilver is the x-men character <laughs> yes he's a very good shield for uh hawkeye oh oh too soon too soon <laughs> um, both seasons two and three were cut down to 13 episodes why uh, I th well, first of all, when the first season ended, they weren't sure if they were going to get a second season. Right. So it ends on a cliffhanger with Optimus Primal kind of blowing up in space. Um, oh yeah. And I think I think it was decided that basically the for the show to continue would be like on a shorter term, like with sh fewer episodes. And so not only are these guys writing this show, kind of trying to incorporate all the toys that Hasbro wants and working within the constraints of like whatever the animation budget's going to allow and whatever number of episodes they're able to be No, yeah, you have a story arc. Oh, my gosh. 
So it's in the second season where they really kind of ramp up the the story. And by that, I mean, like, at this point, Hasbro has told them, okay, you can do this, you can do that. So in the second season, they, they find out that they are indeed on Earth. Right. And they're not just on Earth. They're in Earth during prehistoric time, which means this show involves time travel. Right, because the original Cybertron did exist after Earth civilization had evolved. Yes. Uh, yeah. Because you have to remember the original Transformers took place during the 1980s. Yeah. So in other words, the Autobots and Decepticons had to have existed at least in 1984. And a fact that most people forget about, the original Transformers show begins with the Autobot and Decepticon ships crash landing on Earth during prehistoric time. Right. And so for thousands of years, for millions of years, the Autobots kind of lay in stasis on Earth before they woke up in the 1980s. Up until the this point in the second season of Beast Wars, fans of the original Transformers were pretty opposed to the idea because they weren't sure if it was how it was connected at all to the original series. They just couldn't get past the idea of, you know, the robots turning into animals instead of vehicles. I think they had a they had a tagline that was like truck not monkey. <laughs> Because they were literally, like, in a sense, protesting Transformers. Now, can you imagine if the internet had been prevalent at the time, what the backlash would have been to Beast Wars? Well, apparently there were early message boards that did exist related to Transformers. And something I want to credit Bob Ford and Larry Dottilio for is they actually went on these message boards to engage with fans. Oh. And ask them, like, oh, what can we do to incorporate elements of classic Transformers into our show? All right. What was it? Mm-hmm. And what they ended up doing is basically the way they ended the second season was a brilliant story device of essentially trying to connect the original Transformers show with Beast Wars. Okay, what was that? We find out that Megatron's plan is to destroy Optimus Prime, destroy the Autobots. All Megatron has to do is find where their bodies are. Because if they're on prehistoric Earth, if the Beast Wars characters are on prehistoric Earth, that means that they... Autobots and Decepticons are there somewhere as well. With the, oh, is that where the, the Nemesis ship and the Genesis ship come in? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's what, wow. Well, Megatron's plan originally is actually to eliminate the human race. Right. Because he knows that in the future, the humans will help the Autobots. So he, I think it's halfway through season two, the Predacons find essentially like a village of Neanderthals. Yeah. And we're led to believe, okay, like these are like the precursor to human beings. So Megatron decides he's going to basically wipe out all these creatures so that human beings will never be born and that the Autobots will not have the help of the humans and that they'll lose the war. And this is where Dinobot has his final stand and essentially sacrifices his life to protect the human race. So crazy. Oh, man. Yeah. I I rewatched his death scene in preparation for this episode to try to bring myself (laughs) spoiler alert he dies he dies and it's honestly a very tragic death and like the the words of wisdom he has to pass on he's like look i did some good stuff i did some bad stuff let let the record like speak for itself tell my tale to those who ask tell it truly the evil deeds along with the good and let me be judged accordingly the rest is silence. It's it's quite again impactful, powerful storytelling for a show about transforming robots. And it's only after his plan to wipe out the human race fails that Megatron decides to go all the way and kill Optimus Prime. Because mm-hmm. if you kill the Autobots, then obviously the, they're the, going to win the war. Yeah. Yeah. So the second season ends on the cliffhanger of Megatron blowing up. Optimus Prime's head. I, again, since, since as a kid, I didn't know what Transformers was except for Beast Wars. Oh, yeah. But I had a cousin who was older than me and it was into Transformers. So through him, I got to watch the first animated Transformers movie. So I understood that there were these different Transformers that t- didn't turn into animals, but vehicles. Right. And then all of a sudden I get to this part of Beast Wars. And I'm like, whoa, like it's the same ones from that movie. And, and it was... Again, like the idea of time travel was still kind of new to me. Right. So it seemed very impressive that they, the sh- two shows were connected in such a way. Now, how did they end up fixing that? Is Was it like when he uses the AllSpark to create that like metropolis that he saves Optimus Prime or? So the AllSpark isn't in this. Okay. Um, basically what happens in season three is that Optimus Prime Mole 
takes the spark of Optimus Prime into his body while they repair it. And that gives Optimus Primal his third form, Optimal Optimus, which was my favorite and my favorite toy of the, tr- the Beast Wars era. Nice. Uh, I had many of the toys, including this Optimus Primal, who is not my favorite, but it's the one I still have, so it is what it is. But apparently, like, they actually, like, got one specific fan to consult on the story for that. And he's oh, wow. he's actually credited on the uh, episode. That's super cool. So he's he's credited as being the first Transformers fan to actually be accredited on a Transformers TV show. That's actually really neat. So I got to give those guys props because honestly, like they could have they could they didn't have to do that. They didn't have to try and appeal to this older fan base mm-hmm. of Transformers fans to tell their show. Yeah, but they did, and it clearly helped work to and make it even like, better. It was super intense. Like once again, I have to rewatch a lot of it, but there was a lot of really cool like. Um, there's like Gravity Falls and recent shows like that. They'll always have this big overarching mystery and some of them pull it off well and some of them don't. Uh, but like Transformers did manage to pull off this really crazy and complex show. Like when they, uh, so when the first seasons of like Beast Wars ends, you end up in the second series, I'll call it after the first set of seasons, uh, where they're in this like, uh, like Megatron grabs this like way to create a city or something. Oh, please don't, please don't mention beast machines right I'm, now. I'm mentioning beast machines. No. Um, and it was just uh. really interesting to see, um, like just they're they kind of lose. They, they lose after beast wars and they're, they're stuck as like trash in this like crazy city. I'm, I'm begging you. We, beast machines is, is terrible. But Beast Machines is the is the what became the the sequel to Beast Wars, and that'll be a topic for another day itself because it, it it is it is at best polarizing. Yeah, among Transformers fans. Yeah. But let's focus on the good. Let's stay with the Beast Wars Ooh, today. Stay with the good stuff. So, season three is shorter, and I remember it being darker as a kid. But in reflecting upon it and looking looking at what the YouTubers had to say, mm-hmm. apparently it's actually a sillier season. Some of the designs that they introduce for the characters are a little more intense. Like Cheetor's second, third design is like like almost like a werewolfy kind of thing. Oh jeez! Uh, they call it Transmetal Two, and this is the point where Megatron turns into like a red dragon. Oh yeah, I man, I forgot about that. I was wondering about that. So yeah, uh, third season I don't remember as well, but again, it did a good job of continually introducing characters whose allegiances were kind of fuzzy, and you're like, okay, like this guy's a bit of a pacifist, so he doesn't really care about the Beast Wars. Then you have this guy who he's technically a maximal, but he only really cares about destroying this one character. So he's not really working with the others very well. Um, I would say almost it was almost too complex for like my little brain yeah. to really kind of understand. It I all. think like watching it back now and knowing the history of the Transformers, like I'd get way more out of it. Like I, I would almost skip to season two because I, I kind of remember most of season one. And plus they were mostly one shots. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'd be yeah, very curious. If, if anyone's listening to this and like, yeah, I should really check the show out. I would agree. Skip the season two. Cause that's the point when Hasbro knew what they were doing or knew what they wanted. Yeah. And so like were- watch episode one and then skip to season two. Just knowing that they fight a whole bunch on their ships and near their ships. And then, you know, yeah, yeah there's characters that kind of come in and you might be confused by, but you can Google it. Yeah. Google it, all the things, but literally like seven of the 13 episodes of season three were dedicated to introducing new, new toys. So you think of it, that's more than half the season just solely existing so that they could introduce new toys. Which is crazy. New modes for existing characters, not introducing like brand new characters. Prime Rage mode. Prime Rib mode. <laughs> well, no, no, there's Transmetal 2. I transform into the, the cooked version of all these animals. Oh, no, he's turned into a drumstick. <laughs> yeah, and, and some people make the comment that like the end of Beast Wars, like the finale is kind of rushed. And that's because the showrunners were kind of told the last minute that their show was that they were looking to essentially like rebrand Transformers again. Right. And so not only were like the, was the show continuing, but in a different name and different look, but these guys weren't going to be continuing it. So they had to like all of a sudden try and wrap up the story they had been telling. And they had gotten to the habit of just ending their seasons on cliffhangers. Like, Oh, I guess we'll get another season. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's a lot of like uh, work at the last minute to try and like put their f- kind of final stamp on the story, which makes a lot of sense for the flying fortress because that could have been so much more. Once again, I don't know what it is, but I got stuck on that 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 whole series. Uh, but that could have been a whole lot more involved. So I, I've kind of reached the end of my notes here, but reflecting upon it, like yeah, it was my introduction to Transformers. It 
it got me excited to go buy the toys because you see them transform on TV and you're like, oh, I want to replicate that experience for myself. Yeah. And uh, it, it was just, I don't know. Especially like not the smaller uh, Transformers because they always felt a little bit fiddly, but like the bigger ones like Ry- Rycor. There's there's Rhinox. There's Rhinox, Rhinox. So like the bigger ones like Rhinox feel really cool when you're like, I just changed this robot into a rhinoceros. Like this is kind of cool. Like there is something about transforming robots that is just essentially fun. And to say like the show is fun. Like there are lots of comedy bits. There's like a lot of slapstick comedy. There's a lot of uh, weird moments. Like this show's Megatron likes to take uh, trips in a hot tub. Oh yeah. And, and with like uh, the equivalent of a glass of wine. Yeah, and he's got like rubber duckies. Like, like there's some weird, silly kind of slapsticky kind of stuff. Like Waspinator is kind of like the most comic relief character. He get gets blown up like how many times? And he every other episode. Like, uh, it, it's like the Team Rocket's blasting off again of Beast Wars. Like it really is. Yeah. So we're, we might making this, or we're probably making this show sound super dark and serious. But there's lots of levity. There's lots of comedy. There's lots of silly moments kind of mixed in train your kids to enjoy the tv shows they have now by starting them off with beast wars okay yeah we should give some shout outs to some of these voice actors so gary chalk is the man who plays optimus primal what else does he do that's how i know him uh he's he's you know him to see him he's in a lot of movies as like a military guy or a cop but what's interesting here is that he played optimus primal but then later on, he was the voice of Optimus Prime in a couple different Transformer shows. Oh, sweet. And then we have David Kay as Megatron. Yes. <laughs> and what else did he play? Uh, he went on to become Megatron and the like Decepticon Megatron and a bunch of stuff. He's been in a bunch of anime, a bunch of other stuff. But what's interesting about him is that he not only played Megatron but then in one series he was Optimus Prime. Oh, interesting. So wow. He's like yeah, he's he's played both roles oh, in in different series. So weird to think about. But yeah, it's like that deep commanding voice and you could kind of apply that if if you have the range, you can pretty much do anything you want. That's kind of neat. And the other actor we have to mention his name is Scott McNeil. I recognize that name but I'm not sure why. In this series he plays four different characters. So, so he plays Dinobot, mm-hmm. he plays Rat Trap, okay, yeah. he plays Waspinator, yep. and Silverbolt. Oh, he does play Silverbolt. Yeah. Okay, see, Silverbolt and Dinobot, it would be very difficult to do the differentiation between, like, Waspinator and Rat Trap makes a ton of sense. You know, Waspinator is very easy to kind of copy, and then Rat Trap, you just, you just talk like that. Like, it, it's... And then, of course, you're Dinobot. And, like, like, it's very easy to jump between those three voices, but Dinobot to Silverbolt, I think, would be so subtle that... Silverbolt is like this. Ah, I understand. Ah, okay. Now I'm going to have to rewatch all of it. I, I knew him best, uh, Scott McNeil, as the Canadian voice of Piccolo in Dragon Ball Z. No way, that's him? Yeah, in the Canadian oh. dub. Like, not, not the English dubs you'd hear nowadays. But yeah, yeah, but still, that's... He oh, played that's Wolverine in X-Men uh, Evolution. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so he's, he was duo in Gundam Wing. Like, he's Canadian famous. Yeah, he's done a lot of anime. That's great. Oh, sweet, cool. Got so out. Scott McNeil, well done. You basically voiced like a huge chunk of my childhood on your own. And uh, yeah, the, and what's very interesting is that a lot of his characters actually like have conversations with each other. <laughs> so like Rat Trap and Dinobot have quite the relationship, if you want to call it that where they're essentially fighting with each other, and that's the same guy doing both voices. So, <laughs> Which is just really funny to think about. That's a whole Rick and Morty thing going on. Yeah? Well, uh, you better hope so. For your sake. <laughs> Excuse me. Are you implying that the current situation is somehow my responsibility? Well, you did start it, gearhead. I beg to differ, cheese lips. So I, I've seen a lot of Transformer shows, and I don't know if my nostalgia goggles kind of showing up, but I would go as far to say that even though it was the one I was introduced to first, I still think Beast Wars, from a storytelling perspective, was the best of the Transformer shows I've watched. And I agree with that just because of what we discussed. Like, they did not have the budget to do anything other than good story. So, like, if if it stood up on those legs, you know, like... Uh, it's kind of hard to to claim otherwise. Whereas recent stories, not to say that it didn't have good writing, but they didn't depend on it as much. Absolutely. 
So Beast Wars Transformers is available somewhere. It's not on any streaming services that I know about. I'm sure if you like Google it, you can find the home video <laughs> releases somewhere. Oh, yeah, easily. It's For anyone who grew up in the 90s, it's iconic. Uh, and I would say it, it basically kept Transformers alive, first of all. Let's just acknowledge that. Yeah. like If, it, if, if this wasn't successful... It would have gone the way of Zoids. Yep. Yeah. And a lot of people out there would be like, what's Zoids? It's like, exactly. Like, that literally could have happened to Transformers. Like the Transformers movies that have recently, like as terrible as they might be, they're still Bumblebee's whole, pretty good. Yeah, Bumblebee's a really nice retake. Um, like there's all these very recent uh, Transformers TV shows, the Transformers kids shows. Like there is a lot of different pies that have Transformers in them, which not very tasty pies, but it's there. Whereas Zoids, which was a very popular um, alternate like robots fighting kind of thing. I think it's down to just, like, a few games. I don't think I've seen a TV show about it in a long time. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's crazy. Average Joe, maximize. Oh, pixel patch. Terrorize. (laughs) (laughs) Beast Wars. Well, with that being said, it's time to go into the Batchar and look at our mail. All right. Clickety-clack. Uh, and we're doing the spoiler warning on this one. Yes. Yeah, so we got another email about Avengers Endgame. So once again, we are going to be talking about spoilers for Avengers Endgame. I realize it's been almost a month now, but we should still honor those who haven't seen it. So Honor a, the fallen. <laughs> there'll be a time code in the description where you can skip around this section as we talk about spoilers from Avengers Endgame. Don't spoil the Endgame. Don't do it. Don't spoil the end game. I'm watching you. Don't spoil the end game. I'm watching you. Seriously. Don't spoil the end game. All right, and this email is from Jeremy Cote. Hey, Jeremy, all the way on the West Coast. Hey, fellas, so good to hear your voices again. Again, what happened? Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe because of all the... Because he us. hasn't been listening lately. Ah, I see, I see. Love the episode you guys put out. Only thing that would have made it better would have been Asian John being there, too. Yes, we miss you, Asian John. Uh, one of my biggest gripes with the movie was the Infinity Glove that Tony built. It seemed like in the other Marvel movies, especially Infinity War, there was a big deal made about the Infinity Gauntlet made on a dwarf planet and how it was the only thing in the universe capable of harnessing the power of all Infinity Stones. Then in the end game, the Avengers finally get all six zone and Tony suddenly has some fancy technology to make another glove. It seems suspect to me. Would you agree? Is there a precedent for that in the comics? Thanks again, fellas. So I'm actually going to start a response on this one because I actually watched a few videos because it was bugging me. Now, there's no direct answer to it, which makes a lot of sense, but there are two points that can be made. Um, one of the big ones, it's uh, a lot of it is the wielder. So, of course, like Hulk using the stones. Uh, But the second one was Black Panther. At the end of that movie, they open their borders and allow more vibranium out into the world, which vibranium is like the ultimate sponge for damage and dangerous things. And movie previous to Black Panther, Iron Man has this nanotech suit, or sorry, in uh, Avengers Infinity War, has this nanotech suit that just kind of morphs and and grows from pretty much nothing. Um, And so the argument was that within the five years, because Tony is literally constantly making robots and like making them out of the best stuff he can with like newer and newer tech, that he would have, of course, incorporated vibranium into his newer suit designs. Uh, especially with Wakanda trying to help him out with everything that had happened during the snap. And so a vibranium Iron Man gauntlet would be capable of handling an Infinity Stones. And yeah, the dwarves are insane craftsmen, and I don't think that even with the vibranium, it technically would be able to handle it, but that's a way of partially explaining it. But then the second half of that is it's the wielder. You know, if you put Mjolnir in an elevator, the elevator lifts it, it... The elevator is not worthy. You know, the Iron Man suit might be taking most of the the brunt here. But, yeah, I don't know. Your thoughts? 
when I watch the movie, that kind of stuff just doesn't. I don't think about those kind of things. Oh, really? I don't think about like the mechanics of these kind of things as much. Uh, you know, at that point, I was just like kind of just invested in the story. I'm like, okay, they got the stones, good. Like, let's let's get this thing going here. Uh, but what you say makes a lot of sense in terms of like Tony being able to build his now tech suit out of vibranium because that Black Panther suit is essentially the same thing, like the yeah. the one that's in the movie. So. I was totally, I was like, yeah, whatever. The vibranium in the nanotech suit is absorbing most of the impact of the stones. And so that's a way to get around explaining that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm also like willing to chalk it up to like Storm, or not Storm. Storm! Storm the X-Men! <laughs> that, uh, that both Rocket and Thor are present for this. So like, I don't know if there's some kind of magic that Stormbreaker can kind of enchant the gauntlet with so that it can mimic the qualities of the infinite gauntlet that Mm -hmm. that they required or maybe it is just a fact that the nanobots in the iron man suit slash gauntlet is so advanced that it can literally react to the infinity stones themselves yeah which you know like obviously it's definitely a bit of a stretch but it's not too crazy um but yeah the infinity stones are crazy powerful and like even like just explaining it away that these dwarves could make a glove to harness the infinity stones is already a crazy stretch. Like, oh yeah, they can just make something to handle five infinite things. It's fine. Six. It's a, six infinite things. That's, yeah. a, that's a lot more than five. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you're talking about infinite things. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, like, like, and they, and that's a, it's a plot element that they put in the movies that wasn't even the, cause I'm pretty sure in the comics, it's just a yellowish orange glove. Oh yeah. It's, it's so. just like, there you go. It's the glove. Like they don't really talk about it. Um, in the in the original comics, it's just a MacGuffin for which is just a placeholder item uh, to hold the Infinity Stones. Yeah, like they literally could have someone just with the five Infinity Stones in their hand, but with the gauntlet, it just makes a little bit more sense. Like it literally, especially if you have six Infinity Stones. Yes, yeah, good goodness, not not the five that I normally have. I obviously never go for the Soul Stone. I love the things I love too much. <laughs> uh, but like some of the uh, some of the drawings for the original infinity gauntlet just look like a yellow latex bathroom glove with five stones set in it like it it it's not a very and then a sixth one on the thumb yeah yeah oh gosh <laughs> <laughs> you can't do it but but yeah like when i was i didn't really ref- and i think another thing people asked me about was like well how is tony stark able to do it and it's like well he kind of didn't do it because he like kind of died he died like immediately afterwards so yeah. uh, hopefully that answers your questions jeremy uh, about the Infinity Gauntlet they had in Endgame. So this is normally when we would go into the batch art to find out what we're going to talk about next time. But um, a little lamp just showed up here to remind us of what's to come for next week. Ooh, a lamp. What kind uh, of lamp? It's a magic lamp. Whoa. And, and if we rub it, um, something might come out. Can I wish for more wishes? Uh, yes. You can try that, see what happens. All right. But no, we're getting uh, the second live action disney remake of the year we uh chose to not talk about dumbo because i haven't even seen the original dumbo and it's terrifying let's just be honest i don't want to put money towards that and it flopped yeah so So, we're good so you know what i'm talking about right yeah yeah the guy Ritchie directed aladdin movie starring toronto native mena masood so we got a good old canadian boy in there so it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with this thing because you got an Australian playing Jasmine. You got Will Smith as the genie. It's yeah. directed by a guy who's done a lot of action movies, but they clearly are maintaining a lot of the, like the musical Slastic comedy and musical bits. Like you ain't never seen a show like this, but yeah. you have, you've seen the entire show like this. Yeah. So based on like an Alan Tudyk from Firefly is the voice of Iago. No way. Yeah. What's with him and playing birds? <laughs> like he's just for the next five years, he's just going to play birds. Uh, Do you have good feelings about this movie? I think that overall it's going to be beautiful to look at and at least generally enjoyable. Like, I don't think it's going to be as much of a flop uh, as most of... Like, I think it's going to do better than Lion King. Ooh, that's a hot take. Yeah, yeah. It's a hot take. Now, of course, with like Will Smith being in it and all the arguments over just like, oh, the design looks a little bit weird. I'm thinking it won't do as well as Lion King. But in my personal opinion, I think it is going to be better produced and have a more uh, enjoyable watching experience than The Lion King will. 
Wow. Yeah. That is a hot take. Like you can make some hot cakes out of that hot take. Ooh, I'll uh, put them in the oven. Oh, oh still, I, I got to put some gloves on. It's too hot. And I, listen, like, no one left a bigger impact in my childhood than Robin Williams. Yeah. He, he is iconic yeah. as the genie. Like, I will actually enjoy um, Will Smith as a genie. He's got that kind of, like, high energy, um, like, talking. But, yeah, no, Robin Williams was just... Uh, you, you can't replace him, so try to do something different. So that's kind of nice. Yeah. So come back to the Bachelor podcast next week when we head to the, uh, what's it called? Agraba? Agraba. Yeah, we're going to be. And the night, Arabia night. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to be in Agraba next week. So come back to the Bachelor podcast. I'll uh, be very aggravated. Oh. oh. <laughs> Until that time, I'm Average Joe. I'm Pixel Patch. Catch on the flip side. One grain of sand at a time.